Our next speaker is Dr. Ivan uh, Yamshikov. He is a postdoctoral researcher at Max Planck Institute for math, um, Mathematics in the Sciences, so the one in Leipzig, Germany. He is also an AI evangelist and the co-founder of Created Labs. Uh, his research interests include data analysis, neural networks, and AI in applications to cognition and content generation. So, uh, please welcome Ivan. Okay, I'll try to, to use them, but I'm not sure it's going to work. Um, okay, thank you very much, the organizers. Uh, first of all, I would like to correct, so I'm AI evangelist of Abby not just AI evangelist, though I like AI in general. Um, so, um, my talk is Creative AI, and we'll talk about what's happening with creativity. Uh, can machines be creative? How can we use machines to do something creative now? And how we should use them. And um, I recently thought that a good introductory talk is actually a talk that gives you a set of search queries. If you leave with a set of good search queries that you can follow up later, it's probably a good introductory talk. So as we go, I'll try to also point you out to some uh, queries that might give you more information if you want to go into details and dive deeper. But we'll start about talking with um, what's happening with statistical learning in general, why it is called imitational learning, how can we still use it for art, and then we'll discuss how did we end up in a situation when we have almost the only paradigm that works is statistical learning. Why did it happen? Who's this evil genius that made machines not creative? Or like, what's wrong with it? And then we'll discuss possible ways to make machines more creative. Uh, but before, I'll just briefly talk about myself. So I'm um, interested in generation of natural language uh, and actually any discrete sequences. So whenever I have a talk, people say, that was too introductory. So if you want to go deeper, take a photo of that slide, read the papers, and we can discuss them afterwards. Uh, but this is one area, and the research part is very interesting for me, but today I won't talk too much about NLP. I'm also an AI evangelist of Abby, and uh, David had a talk today about what it is about RPA and so on. I think that the only thing that I should add is that we are hiring, and if you are working on AI and you want to do cutting edge AI applications to business processes and generate tons of value for people and probably you want to relocate to Moscow to get in touch with me please after the talk or per email or on Facebook or whatever. Um, the last part of my activities is the most weird one and this is the part about which I, uh, I'm going to talk today. It's this side project that we call Created Labs. We started it with Alexei Tikhonov with a weird project that was called Neurona Barona uh, I don't know what's happening, but apparently I pressed the wrong button. Um, so, okay. Uh, so we generated some poetry with uh, recurrent neural networks, and we stylized it as a Russian punk rock singer Igor Letov, and we made an album out of it, and we got a lot of people listening to it. I'll give some more details further. Another example that I want to give is um, this video. Can you start it, please? So this is the opening of a conference in Moscow in 2017. Could we have sound a bit up? Yeah. So this is actually a small orchestra playing music generated by a neural network and orchestrated by a living person. Uh, this is a motor composer, Maria Chernova. We collaborated with her on that. had like 3,000 people watching, that was very, very weird experience. 3,000 people were listening to something that neural network generated. And now the drama starts. So this solo is played by Peter Terman. Peter Terman is a grandson of Leo Terman, who actually invented this wonderful instrument uh, that basically uses the capacity of, of the environment to manipulate the frequencies. It's one of the first electronic instruments created in 1922 in Petrograd. Well, so that's the thing. This is one of the examples. And now we'll play uh, a game that I hope gives you more intuition about art and creativity. So the first question is, who's this guy? I, I can hear it shouted out. Who's the guy? 
Van Gogh. Brilliant. Of course, it's just a red-headed guy. It's a, it's a random red-headed guy in a neural network that implied the style transfer algorithm to a photo of a random red-headed guy. And this style transfer algorithm was developed in Tübingen in 2016, and then it blew up and people created Prisma. Um, and you can actually do now that on your own mobile phone. Let's continue playing that game. These are the examples from Anton Slesarev, who is doing machine vision, uh, his research group in Moscow. Um, OK, so you have two paintings. Who thinks that the painting, OK, we, we'll, we'll, we'll think that this one, like you sit. Who thinks that the right painting, painting is created by a human? Raise your hand. OK. Who thinks that the left painting is created by the human? Raise your hand. OK, very nice. Both of them are created by a neural network. Um, OK, you see that I'm actually deceptive here. So focus. This is a hard game. It's not as easy as you think. We keep, we keep on playing. Who thinks that the painting on the right from you was created by a human? Raise your hand. OK, some cautious hands over here. Who thinks that the painting on your left is created by a human? Who thinks that both are created by a neural network? Who thinks that both are created by a human? OK, well, you're right. That's the right painting. That's, um, that's uh, actually human written. Can you explain why? Oh, you can't explain that. That's fine, because the left one is actually written by a human. Um, but I told you that it's the right one, and you believed me. And this is a profound property of human intelligence. People tend to rationalize backwards and remember things. And we are very good at that. And somehow we cannot teach neural networks to be as good as we are in this post-rationalization. It doesn't matter if it's wrong or right. It's important that we remember things for a long time and we can draw conclusions on what we remember really fast. Now, actually, if you looked in the, in the corner of the picture, on the left, it says Vincent over there. This is the actual signed Van Gogh, the only one that you saw today. Sorry for not so much Van Gogh in my talk. Um, OK, these are the examples of transfer learning. Um, these are examples of what we call narrow AI. And these examples became possible because of the thing that mathematicians call information decomposition. Information decomposition is this idea that there are different types of information, right? And in this particular case, on these pictures, there is what is drawn on the picture, the contours, the lines, the meaning of the picture, right? And there is how the picture is drawn, stylistic part of information. Um, the interesting story about it is that the information theory was developed by two genius mathematicians, one of which were, was Russian and one of which was American, of course. And you can guess from the setup that it was during Cold War. And it was basically developed in order to crack the coding of the opposing side. So Claude Shannon in the US and, and, uh, and Kolmogorov in uh, Moscow were working on that. And they assumed that any information that they can intercept from a spy is a meaningful information. So these two genius died without this idea that some information could be irrelevant. However, we are living in the internet times. And if you open your Facebook, you know that there is so much information that is actually useless. Um, and we would like to have this understanding of what's on the picture. We would like to have the meaning. But it's actually really hard to extract. Here are some other examples of, uh, of AI used for this style transfer. For example, this is a film about um, Vasily Kandinsky, who had three styles during his life work. And we actually made a film where each period of his life was stylized with respect to the picture he was creating in these times. This is another object that I really love. It's called the next Rembrandt. It's actually an average Rembrandt. People in the University of Delft analyzed all the portraits that Rembrandt created, and they found out that on average, Rembrandt draws a male with a beard that's turned half turned to us, and it's dark tones. And they averaged all the portraits and got the next Rembrandt. And then they printed it on a 3D printer so that to repeat the strokes of the brush. And they actually made it a part of Rembrandt exhibition in Delft. Um, this is a great example, I think, and I love the painting, actually. Um, this is another example that we created, so can we listen to some more music, please? So we analyzed some text of Kurt Cobain, and we, music? 
we try to generate My love is all I can relate. This is Rob Carroll, a New York based musician who is singing the lyrics created by the neural network. Sometimes it resembles Kurt Cobain, sometimes it doesn't. Thank you very much. Uh, but uh, there is another interesting example there. Sorry, can you? Yeah. No light awake in solitude. Yeah, I like it, but I skirt it a lot. So, um, okay. So um, there is another line that I really like. It's in another song, but it says, "A God who's always welcome to Iraq." Now, Kurt Cobain died before Iraqi campaign started, but I feel that if he lived, he would write something about the Iraqi campaign. So sometimes you get this serendipitous, creative things. But on average, it's all imitation. And this is what, whenever I give these examples, people say, yeah, but this is like average Rembrandt. It's not the new Rembrandt. Yeah, but it's average Kurt Cobain. It's not a new one. And so it's all about imitation. We do it because this is the paradigm in which we live. Statistical learning is this idea that we observe a lot of data, we generalize on it, and then we may create something, right? And we have intrinsic feeling that we as humans can do better than that. We can create something that we never saw before. I don't want to question this thing, but we have this feeling. I, I hope we all share it. Now, who's in charge of this popularity of this idea that AI should imitate human? This handsome person. Actually, this is Alan Turing. This is the photo of his passport. So you could see that passport photos deteriorated significantly in the 20th century. But he's come up with this idea of Turing test. And he actually copied. The funny thing about Turing uh, test is that it was imitational by design. Back in Turing times, there was a popular game. A woman and a man went to the other room. One man stayed in this room and was sending letters to these two people. A woman was, up, was trying to pretend that she's a man. Then the guy who stayed in the room needed to guess who is the actual man and who is the woman who tries to make the impression that she's actually a man. So Turing said, let's replace a woman with a machine and we'll have a Turing test. And let machine try to prove to us that machine is actually human. And we started to believe in this because it was very instrumental, it was really easy to implement, and machines were incredibly stupid, which contributed a lot to our ego, right? It feels good to know that you're better than a computer. But, and we, and we have a lot of examples where it works, so I gave you some examples where imitational intelligence works. Actually, all the artificial intelligence now, all the breakthroughs, are the results of this paradigm that we need to imitate and base on statistical generalizations of what we saw before. But the problem is that it's fundamentally anthropocentric. Let's imagine for a second that the judge is not a man, but a computer. So I am playing against a computer to prove to the other computer that I'm actually a computer. I will fail miserably, right? Could you imagine winning over a computer, playing it with another computer? No way. What is 2014 multiplied by sinus of 4? You're done. That's it. It's very clear that you're not intelligent enough to pass Turing tests for computers. So this anthropocentric perspective is actually a problem if we would like to do something with creativity and learning. It is a problem because we don't understand the fundamental connection between learning and innovation. Do we learn because we innovate or do we innovate because we learn? And actually, mathematicians are trying to assess this problem from different sides. And I'll, I'll have to skip some slides here. This is one of the examples. This is called surprise maximization in information theory. We try to reproduce algorithms that don't care for the value. They want to just get something new out of this world. You have an algorithm that's somewhere in some artificial system, and it tries to get something new. This is exactly what human babies do. You might see that babies are very risk intolerant. They don't care about risk. They could do bad things to a big dog because they want surprise, because this way you learn faster. This is one thing, and actually the information theory has a formalization of the surprise maximization techniques. And actually there are a lot of proponents who say that this is the only techniques we should do in order to have creative AI. For example, Ken Stanley uh, in Florida University. Um, there is another thing that humans do a lot, it's called knowledge transfer. And in, uh, in machine learning, that's called transfer learning. It started out several years ago, and now it's getting more and more attention. For example, in Abbey products, in FlexiCapture, we use the information about the documents we saw before in order to analyze documents we never saw, right? 
this is the example of transfer learning. So this girl probably was once at the doctor, and then she's already ready to play a doctor with a dog. This guy saw Chewbacca once, and now he's Han Solo and Chewbacca. Maybe the guy is a fake. Maybe it's the parents who is just geeky enough to do it. But still, I hope that that's the guy's idea. I really hope, intrinsically. So what should we do, and what are the problems? Why cannot we leave this imitational paradigm? What do we lack in terms of theory and implementation to do that? These are the main bottlenecks. And this is something that people work on all over the world, and I think we should work more on that. Um, so the first thing is the learning without predefined value functions. This is uh, what's called, for example, neat algorithms, the novelty optimization algorithms. This is the idea that we should train systems to look for something new and unexpected rather than for something that they saw before. We are already good enough when we deal with something we saw before. We have major problems with heavy tails, with rare events, with one-shot learning, right? Another area is semi-critical um, states memory. So what is semi-critical semi state? It's a situation that maybe you heard of, it's called butterfly effect. If butterfly wings make a small movement in this place, somewhere there would be a huge earthquake. So funny thing, but our own natural language is a semi-critical system. If at some point of my talk I mention something, for example, I mentioned Van Gogh several times, you remember about it throughout the whole talk, and I can make a reference to it right now, and you'll be, yeah, that makes sense. He talks about Van Gogh on the AI talk. I understand how it fits into the picture. Our current dialogue AIs cannot do it. They cannot remember long correlated sequences with weak correlations that are far apart. This is something that we need to work on. And the last part is the theory of semantic information. So Shannon's theory of information, or Kolmogorov's theory of information, are assuming that any information is valuable. We need to have some idea of saliency within information. What is meaningful? What makes sense? And actually, this addresses a lot the problems that were uh, discussed in the talk about AI safety. Do you remember there was this notion in the morning, AI doesn't have common sense. Of course it doesn't have. It doesn't have sense at all. And that's the problem. Because we might hope that as long as we define sense, maybe the system would start having common sense, right? OK, that's about it. The summary is that imitational intelligence works on any well-defined narrow task, even if this task is actually creative in its nature or fakes it to look like creative one. But in order to have profoundly different paradigm shift and create something that would feel creative from a human perspective, we actually need to leave this anthropocentric perspective for a moment and think about intelligence in the more general terms. That's, that's my talk for today. Thank you very much. Time for your questions. OK, questions? Uh-huh. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you Hi. for the talk, by the way. Um, a Thanks few weeks ago, concerning the portraits and the paintings, yeah. an AI portrait was sold for around $430,000 in an auction. Yeah. So where are we heading to? And where will the artist's role be <laughs> when AI can just paint and we can sell them for that big amount of money? I think they will be exactly where they were all the time. They will be creating art. I mean. Would you say that the AI created portrait didn't have an involvement of a person who would you, call, you would call artistic? I would say it did. It's, it's, uh, it's the person who implemented certain project, created AI portrait, and sold it, right? So why don't you want to call this person artist? I mean, the brush is different. The brush is now a 3D printer and a data analytical uh, algorithm. But you know, back in the Middle Ages, at some point, if people came up with a new color, it's a true story. At some point, some chemicals came out to give a new color. And then the classical painters would say, ah, this is abomination. We cannot use this color because it doesn't fit in the canonical way of how we paint. And, you know, people who painted with this color became El Greco, for example. He's known for his specifically different colors from everybody of his age. So it's just a tool that you can use and still be artistic, right? Any more questions? Just one, if there is one. OK. <laughs> now, Vlad has given a question, and he's also my friend. Um, so, no. Ivan, 
oftentimes in, in these days, uh, there's this whole uh, controversy about you know, what happens when almost everything becomes AI. And not, yeah. not with the like, kind of the fantastical sort of descriptions of AI, but yeah. you know, the ultimate thing that makes us human is what? Love, right? right. Like loving each other and being okay. loved, well, I think. That's my point of view, right? Fair enough. Um, it, it sounds good to me. And, and a lot of what happens with art and even creativity and technology and things that <clears throat> kind of brings newness, novelty and yeah. what have you, it almost has to do some, something to, that is kind of otherworldly. I'm not talking about God. I'm just talking about something yeah. that is driven by passion, driven from the heart yeah. rather than the head. What is your point of view with regards to the evolution of art and technology and, and, yeah. and where we're headed. I'm actually generally very techno-optimistic. I, I feel that I fall out of the vibe of the morning session because I'm very positive about technology. About all these, everything that will become AI scary story, I have a, a very nice thought that I heard. I think it was Kevin Kelly, the, the, the chief uh, of Wired, who said, okay, we have actually four options of a society that's fully AI driven. One is the military structure very robust, everybody's fighting with the outer enemy, and we don't want that, and we have democracy to prevent it happen, right? Then the, the second one is just the society of impressions. And this happens with Instagram being super popular. Your main goal of life is maximizing the level of your personal ex experience and impressions, and I'm fine with this scenario, right? The third option that he names is the society of self-growth. So the idea that it's not only about impressions and sharing it with others, it's actually about your inner um, understanding. Basically, everybody's doing yoga and drinks smoothies and tries to be a mindful person and stuff like this. And the third option is this society of scientists where the main value is actually contributing to something new because this frontier about creativity within algorithms is actually very vague and it's actually still questioned whether it's attainable at all, right? And the funny thing about all these three scenarios, but for the first one, is that I'm fine with all three. I mean, if it's a linear combination of these three scenarios, it's a great society to live in, right? So this is the general take why I think being techno-optimistic is good. It's just you need to care for democracy and you should be against war. It's very important. Everything else should work. And the second thing is addressing your idea of co-evolution of art and, um, and technology. I think that uh, the, the co-evolution co happens all the time because whenever people created the first axe, somebody used it to kill a boar and somebody used it to carve this boar on the wall, right? And this is how technology and art co-evolve co all the time. And I just think that AI brings a lot of new amazing tools on the field, especially in, in context of the postmodern paradigm that we have in art. Because AI is an ultimate tool for a postmodernist, right? It's like, boom, I can stylize anything. Let's play Lego with that. It's just amazing. Okay. Uh, let's thank Ivan for thank you very much. the talk. Thank you very much.